we should know. <laughs> so, welcome. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, as you know, my name is Roger Ritzman. I've represented the library district for uh, a number of years. And you need and to speak into the mic. So our, because we do record Thousands these meetings. Of people. <laughs> <laughs> okay, as I mentioned, my name is Roger Ritzman. I've represented the library district for uh, a number of years, and uh, I'm here tonight to uh, address uh, basically any subjects that you'd like to address. Uh, I did bring a, uh, an outline, I'll hand that out in just a minute, but since we have a, you know, a relatively informal setting here, uh, I'm not, uh, uh, I'm flexible on format and questions and uh, however you want to go and however, however long you want to go. So, uh, so it's a, uh, uh, the equivalent, I'll call it a ask, ask your lawyer night uh, <laughs> on anything, anything and everything that, uh, uh, that tickles your fancy. So if you want to take take one of these, I put an outline together um, just to give us some, some food for thought. And uh, while that's being passed out, um, there's a couple of, uh, couple of attachments there that I'm not going to spend uh, any significant time on, but I've included them simply so uh, you can read yourself to sleep or line your birdcage or whatever. The, uh, the attachments are uh, excerpts from the Open Meetings Act and from the Freedom of Information Act. Mm -hmm. And we can, again, those are subjects we can talk about uh, as you wish. And, uh, you know, just give me the hook when you uh, have heard enough and you want to move on to the other items on your agenda. The first item on the uh, agenda is what I call kind of a 30,000-foot uh, flyover in terms of the, um, you know, board responsibilities and uh, relationships with staff, uh, with the public, um, talk a little bit about, uh, you know, liabilities of the trustees and some of those things. But uh, under uh, item Roman numeral one, subparagraph A, the first item on there is really all about uh, sensitivity to the boundaries that the trustees have with respect to their relationship with the, the staff in general, with the director in particular, um, and what I describe as trying to recognize the need to avoid the micromanagement problem that can plague some units of local government and their relationships. Uh, you know, we are responsible, and when I say we, I, I mean the, the management team here, the trustees, we have a responsibility, um, you know, for you know, general oversight and establishing, you know, policies and directions and strategic plans and big picture items. But uh, in my view, it doesn't work very well if the board is involved in what I'll call the the day-to-day -day management and the day-to-day -day administration of the libraries. And that can be a delicate balance as to uh, how involved the trustees want to be or should be. But if we, you know, if we've hired the right library director uh, and let the library director do his or her job, then we should not be involved in, um, you know, the day-to-day -day administrative responsibilities. Uh, you know, and that takes me to the uh, one of the uh, comments that I put in the outline in terms of uh, the, ch the chain of command and, and recognizing the hierarchy that we have set up. Uh, example, a staff member approaches a trustee with a complaint about another staff member. Uh, and, you know, the response of the trustee almost always should be you need to speak to your supervisor and let the process work. We, you know, you, we have a process for allowing uh, uh, comments or complaints from staff and it's not typically wouldn't be the responsibility of a trustee to solve that employee's problem. Uh, we should recognize the chain of command and let the supervisor uh, handle it and if it needs to go upstream to the director's office then that's what will, uh, that's what will happen. Uh, so we need to be very careful about, you know, those kinds of boundaries. Uh, and so if you're on the fence about what you, you know, what you should do, uh, it may be that it's, pro that it's inappropriate because you're starting to get, get involved in the micromanagement. There's no hard and fast rules. There's no material that I could give you that says 
these activities fall on the side of micromanagement, these are okay. It's a judgment call, but again, it's, uh, you know, it's uh, important to recognize the, uh, the, the boundaries. Let the director do his or her job, and um, your job is you know, a bigger picture job in terms of establishing policies and directions and those kinds of things. The second item on there has to do with uh, your role as a, uh, as a public official. Uh, and that's what we call you. And whether you're a park district commissioner, uh, a school board member, a library district trustee, you're a, you're a public official. And as such, you have what is known as a, a fiduciary responsibility. I know our attorneys on the board are familiar with that. But basically, you have an obligation as a public official and as a fiduciary to represent the interests of the community and not necessarily any individual interests. Uh, the, you know, a, a good example, a real life example is uh, uh, the responsibilities of a trustee who has responsibilities for another person. For example, uh, I'm the trustee uh, for my mother and as she's not capable at this point in time in managing her affairs. And so I have responsibility for, uh, manage, among other things, managing her money. And so I can't spend her money because Roger Ritzman wants to go to Hawaii on vacation. That's not in her interest. My focus is on managing her money as uh, in her best interest. So I'm a fiduciary and I have a responsibility for another person. In this situation, the library trustees are fiduciaries and public officials with responsibility for managing library resources and in the interest of the community and not necessarily what uh, any individual uh, might, uh, you know, might want. Let me give you another real life example. Uh, uh, we have a, there's a, another library district that I represent that has a newly elected trustee and we find out that she ran for the library board and was elected and her purpose for serving on the library board was to buy books that she wanted to read and wanted the library to purchase. It was strictly her, her motivation was uh, to have the library purchase materials that were something that she was interested in. And of course, you know, we have a material selection policy and so that's, you know, that's a, maybe a little bit of a, you know, wild example, but, but in fact, those kinds of things happen and, and the situation in terms of fiduciary responsibility, what's in the best interest of the community are oftentimes uh, amplified when it comes to spending money. And, you know, an individual trustee may be uh, more conservative financially than others, um, but the, the objective is not what, what, you know, I want my taxes lowered versus what's in the best interest of the community. And that's the, that's the hat that we need to wear as trustees, not what I want as an individual trustee, but what, what, what's my sense of what the community wants. That's my obligation as a fiduciary to represent the best interest of the community. And I'm going to read one thing very quickly because I, I think it speaks volumes about this, this concept of individual interest versus community interest. And it comes right out of the Library District Act. And what it says is that the library, this is in the very first section in the, um, after the definition, the library shall be forever for the use of residents and taxpayers of the district in which it is located, subject to reasonable rules and regulation the board adopts to render the use of the library of the greatest benefit to the greatest number of residents and taxpayers. I mean, that's really our job, not our, uh, our individual focus. Third item on my um, agenda has to do, uh, is simply a reminder that we need to be cautious when we're dealing with third parties. And by third parties, it could be vendors, uh, it could be uh, other units of local government, um, any, uh, any, any, any third parties we're dealing with so that that the board speaks with one voice. You know, it's a democratic, you know, entity and we vote and there may be divided votes, but once the vote has uh, been taken, then you know, we have an obligation to say, this is the board's direction, this is the board's decision. Can you say I voted against it? Sure you can. I mean, that's okay, but this is the, the board speaks with one vote and we need to be very cautious in dealing with third parties 
that we're not wearing, not we're, we're not representing a position of the library that's contrary to the to the decision that the board has made. So it's very important that uh, when we're if we're you know if we're talking with uh, as I say other units of government or with vendors, uh, the members of the public, that we remember that we're wearing the hat as a trustee. Uh, unless you specifically identify that I'm not speaking here on behalf of the library, I'm speaking solely in my individual capacity uh, as a citizen and not as a trustee in representing the, the board's decisions or the board's uh, directions. So that's a very important thing. We need to be cautious in, uh, in how we approach um, third parties. Next item, liability, it's on there listed as liabilities, good faith, Discretion, DNO insurance. What liabilities do you face? Uh, almost none. Why is that? Because uh, the law says that units of local government, such as this library district, have extremely broad discretion in um, adopting reasonable rules and regulations to render the use of the library of the greatest benefit to the greatest number of the residents. So. A hypothetical, we, uh, we make a decision or we pass an ordinance and somehow it, it becomes the subject of a lawsuit or a challenge. The judge that rules on the validity of that ordinance does not determine whether that was a wise decision necessarily. The judge will determine whether that's a, that's a subject matter that's within the discretion of the board. And, and will defer to the board's discretion. The judge could say, if I was on that board, I would have voted no, but that's not my job. My job as the judge is to determine whether the decision that the board was made is within the discretion of the board to make. And if so, then I am not here as a judge to second guess that. So we have extremely broad discretion in doing what we think is in the best interest of our uh, community. Uh, as long as we're operating in, uh, in good faith. So you don't need to worry about uh, individual liability for voting your conscience. If you look in the mirror in the morning and say, I voted my conscience, I think that's in the best interest of the community, almost always uh, that's gonna, not going to be second-guessed and you're not going to have any individual liability. Uh, and I'll, I also mentioned that we have uh, directors and officers insurance so that if we do get a claim filed, a lawsuit filed, we have insurance that will uh, protect you know, will defend us uh, in any litigation. And so it, it, your personal resources are not going to be at risk uh, for making decisions which you believe are in good faith decisions that are in the best interest of the community. Last item on there, uh, the board attorney relationship. My job is to represent the board as it expresses itself by majority vote. So, um, the, the attorney-client relationship is between me and my firm and, and the board collectively. I bring that up because occasionally I will be contacted by a trustee who wants information or wants an opinion or wants a, some research done. My first question is, I'm happy to do this, but has this been board authorized? Because I'm not going to spend my time and library district money doing a research project or expressing an opinion only to find out that the board never authorized that. So I'm very careful about that because I'm, I'm very sensitive to the attorney-client relationship that I have with the board as an entity. And my contacts are with the director or the board president. And if somebody, and you, the, the board certainly could delegate another trustee saying, we want information and please contact Ritzman and see and, and find out X, Y, Z, whatever it happens to be. And so if, I'm contacted by a trustee who wants something and I confirm that this has been board authorized, then that's okay. But otherwise we need to be, uh, I, I need to be careful of the, uh, the boundaries of that attorney-client relationship. So that's kind of the, uh, the 30,000 foot flyover of what I see as some of the, uh, you know, the key relationships that, uh, that we need to be mindful of and be cautious about, uh, uh, you know, especially when, uh, well, when, when, when dealing with the, the boundaries of staff and the uh, relationships with uh, third parties. Now, I'm happy to talk about 
finances. I'm happy to talk about open meetings. I'm happy to talk about FOIA. I'm happy to talk about any other issues that you uh, would like. But I, um, I think, uh, you know, you have to tell me how much time you want to spend. Can you go uh, to finances, finances to E yeah. and F? Sure. E and F. The, uh, the Truth in Taxation Act, that, uh, and I just want to be clear that, that that's, a, that that's an Illinois statute that's completely unrelated to the, the PTEL or the tax cap. The Truth in Taxation Act basically stands for the proposition that the county clerk will not levy taxes on our behalf if they exceed last year's revenue not last year's levy. We don't compare levy to levy. We look at our proposed levy, and then we compare that to last year's revenue, or the tax extension that the county clerk has given us, the total revenue. If our proposed levy is 5% or more higher than last year's revenue, the county clerk will not give us that those funds unless we've complied with the Truth in Taxation Act, which says that we have to publish a, what